you just have uh, individuals that are in a space. It's just not beneficial to the economic growth of the area. The issue is how to appropriately um, regulate their existence. It's been a while, over several years now, since a group of volunteers, donors, lawyers, and workers first began working in and around our society to end a crisis and improve the quality of life for those who suffer the crisis, the homeless those living on the streets, and as if that's not struggle enough, there's always pushback by and from local government, always invoking civil and criminal penalty or persecution. The struggle is real. Meet Michael Kimbrell, just a guy who's dedicated his adult life to the notion of ending homelessness, but who more often finds himself chasing at windmills or keeping up with the moving targets. I'm going to go up to the seventh floor and try to get some information. You know, I mean, that's all I can do. Information on what? The sweeps of the homeless. Like, where, where are they? Because they're gone. We've gone into the camps today and they are not there. And they have told, like, we talked to a couple of homeless gentlemen that said that the only reason that they didn't get picked up was because they were hiding in bushes. It's called the right to exist. And it's a crisis that's often discussed lately, but mostly only in hushed tones. It's existing and proliferating in numerous U.S. cities, including Pensacola, Florida, a mid-sized panhandle town just a few hours east of New Orleans. According to Department of Housing and Urban Development statistics, over 580,000 people were defined as homeless in the United States in 2020, and those numbers do not include increases in that population brought on by economic and subsequent hardship impacts due to the year-plus-long pandemic. Worldwide, a staggering 150 million plus people are homeless, with an additional estimated 1.6 billion of world population likely lacking adequate housing. This is Satoshi Forest a nine-acre nature environment that was converted with specific intention to serve as a permanent homeless encampment. In 2013, a nine-acre private environment. Michael Kimbrell and similarly motivated others purchased this property now known as Satoshi Forest. But property ownership notwithstanding, local government was nevertheless more interested in and has mostly put its energies toward criminalizing and penalizing the lives of the vulnerable homeless than attempting to find beneficial, humane solutions. The property resembles most other campsites in Northwest Florida. Cozy signs, restroom facilities, folks cooking food over open fires, and of course, idyllic and ample shade. But unlike the population who routinely visit and even frequent recreational campgrounds, Satoshi's campers live at the site long term. The Satoshi mission is straightforward. Provide homeless a more permanent solution and get them off the streets to a safer location with the goal to achieve permanent physical housing if possible. It is very difficult to get and sustain a job with no roof on your head, nowhere to take a shower, no way to keep your clothes clean. Yeah, uh, you're, you're gonna lose your job. Like it just, it, it almost goes without saying when you really sit down and think about it. And furthermore, if you haven't eaten and you're dehydrated and you're sleeping with one eye open because you're trespassing somewhere and the cops may run you off or someone may rob you if you're sleeping too hard, then how do you even apply for a job or do a good day's job? Michael knows no clock. His full-time, likely all-the-time job is assisting the homeless in Pensacola. 
as volunteer executive director of Satoshi Forest. He keeps things moving by handling administrative tasks, including any issues that arise within the camp. In addition to running Satoshi, Michael Kimbrell's other job since 2018 is director of Pensacola's Alfred Washburn Center, the largest day center serving and assisting the homeless in the community. We find ourselves with homeless outreach is there are so many homeless people and so many services lacking that we're just trying to keep them alive. It is an obsession. It's like there, there's, there's no money in actually helping people unless you're taking the money for yourself and not helping people with it. Escambia County, Florida initiated a fight to deny a legal opening of the camp and refused to embrace the concept as legitimate by any definition. To make matters worse, the county dug its heels in and took Michael to court with the intent to deny the existence of Satoshi Forest. The Great Recession that began in 2008 brought with it unprecedented home foreclosures and unemployment not seen since the Great Depression, and with it a historical nationwide spike in homelessness. The early incarnation of Satoshi came as the city of Pensacola and Escambia County passed a series of anti-homeless laws in the early 2010s at the behest of the city's elite. Fast forward to 2011, following three years of billion-dollar bank bailouts that helped to increase widespread suffering, it was the Occupy movement that erupted and launched its campaign to protest corruption in the uppermost echelons of American society. I think that instead of criminalizing homeless people, we ought to be trying to house them and help them, because criminalizing them only makes it harder for them to get out of homelessness. The original Occupy movement was born in New York City, on Wall Street, and its messaging and demand for change became an international inspiration. Occupy rallies were organized, including those that took place in Pensacola. We're not here for a free handout. We're here to get our government to start working the way it's supposed to work. It's not supposed to be lobbied by special interests that only look out for themselves. It's supposed to be here for the people. And it was at that very time that activist Michael Kimbrell and advocates also worked to address hunger issues and established a Food Not Bombs chapter. Our first food sharing was at the initiation of Occupy Pensacola and it just snowballed from there. The first Food Not Bombs chapter was founded in 1980 by anti-nuclear activists. It provided free meals to the public needy to illustrate and protest what had become a worldwide artificial scarcity of food due to war, poverty, and economic crisis. Chapters often work with donated and reclaimed food, including some found and retrieved from garbage bins and dumpsters. The humanitarian concept and nature of the Food Not Bombs mission began growing and today there are an estimated 400 Food Not Bombs chapters worldwide. The homeless and the homeless communities frequently rely on Food Not Bombs for meals. Food Not Bombs helped feed the Occupy Pensacola tent city for months. That was until the city's police moved in and destroyed the encampment at City Hall and marked the end of the Occupy movement and its mission. But the Occupy movement had a profound impact on the lives of those who participated, with many going on to work on humanity-driven projects. Satoshi Forest was one of those. Since 2011, Food Not Bombs continues to share food every Friday at Pensacola's Martin Luther King Jr. Plaza near the bustling and expanding downtown area. Periodically, the city grows hostile towards the chapter and city officials have for years expressed distaste for Food Not Bombs activities because of the homeless they attract and feed at that specific location.
Monday was World Homeless Day. And this council decided to have a conversation about the criminalization of homelessness and how we needed to be stricter on our homeless in Pensacola. In 2013, under the direction of Pensacola Mayor Ashton Hayward, the City Council passed a specifically restrictive ordinance that included both a ban on camping and what can only be described as a blanket ban, which denied any person the use of a blanket outdoors. The camping ban forbade persons inside the city limits from sleeping in tents and also prohibited such activities as face washing, shaving, and food preparation in a public restroom. These ordinances effectively made living on the streets illegal. The subsequent winter of 2014 was Pensacola's coldest on record. Despite fierce opposition from Michael Kimbrell and others, it was not until Vice News and other national media outlets reported coverage of the blanket ban and lawmakers reconsidered the legislation, as city leaders feared negative national press might harm local tourism, and it didn't take long until the city moved to repeal its blanket ban. But as is still the case in other U.S. cities, the camping ban remains in place and on the books as law today. Satoshi's founding was enabled by Bitcoin, the world's first cryptocurrency. In fact, Satoshi Forest was one of the first nonprofit projects ever funded by Bitcoin, and the currency was so essential to the project that the newly acquired property was named for what was the alias of Bitcoin's anonymous creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. It was right at the same time as the city of Pensacola was passing the anti-camping ordinance that we and we had all gone and argued against it and it passed anyway. So we were like, well, what what would be the best way to utilize this money? And it was, well, if you can't camp on public land, maybe you can camp on private land. So we started looking for property and, you know, we found Shitoshi Forest and, you know, we thought it was just, you know, the perfect um, response to the city's criminalization of poverty. With engineered site plans in place that featured a tent encampment, construction of tiny homes, a bathhouse, community kitchen, gardens, and sitting areas, Satoshi Forest was ready to start building. Or so Michael Kimbrell thought. But word in town spread quickly that the project was afoot and the need was so strong that it was immediately met with positive response from its target community. In the winter of 2013, the homeless began leaving the streets and pitched the first tents in Satoshi Forest. Given this movement, Satoshi prepared to apply for all necessary permits. But as they were doing so, an area resident, Rick Grimes, organized a petition among his neighbors in the adjacent Mayfair neighborhood community that pushed for an end to Satoshi as undesirable neighbors. Within only one month of its opening, Escambia County issued Satoshi Forest its first code violation, citing unpermitted temporary shelters. We did not expect litigation and code violations, but this is the exact opposite response that we thought we were going to get helping people. To help with Satoshi's legal issues, Will Dunaway, a local attorney, reached out to Michael Kimbrell. Dunaway had read an article in In Weekly, a local newspaper, and offered to take on the case for Satoshi and its residents pro bono. Since 2014 and to this day, Dunaway has remained Satoshi's land use attorney. The spring of 2014 brought positive news and furthered hope for the Satoshi development when a local judge issued a temporary ruling that tents could remain on the property as temporary shelters for the next nine months in accordance with the local land development code. With Satoshi, Michael Kimbrell, Dunaway, and the homeless victorious in their first head-to-head -head skirmish with the county, their victory became short-lived, and what followed became a tangled multi-year and multi-court case. 
I was here to find out, seeing how the magistrate ruled that these temporary structures could stay, what the, what's our next step? We just need more teeth in this law. This morning I recommended a two-part vote from you all this evening. One would be to authorize my office to appeal the ruling of the special magistrate. The second part would be to direct your planning staff to review their temporary structures ordinance for any tweaking that should be uh, necessary. We thought that it definitely was going to receive some flack from city and county officials. Um, we did not expect it to receive the amount of flack that it has. Um, but we honestly, you know, had conversations about, you know, getting, you know, letters of commendation and, you know, the key to the city and stuff like that for, you know, you know, trying to help people in our community. Um, turned out, you know, that that probably will never happen. <laughs> but. Unlike what is defined as illegal homeless camps, Satoshi creates structure. Michael Kimbrell set the protocol of interviewing potential residents in advance to determine a good fit for the community and new residents who are approved and move in are extended a 30-day probationary period during which they may be asked to leave. The forest community has hard and fast rules, including the requirement that all residents maintain a clean and orderly camp area. And the camp gives residents a say in how they wish to live. Uh, people experiencing homelessness um, all experience it for different reasons, and what it takes to get them out of homelessness is also requires different amount of times. Uh, so we don't put a, a set time limit on people, but we do, we are constantly encouraging them to work on getting out of the situation that they're in. I'm actually a certified CNA nursing assistant. I'm a um, certified um, care aide. I um, committed fraud with my own personal bad checks. In order for me to get that record a sponge, I would have to pay $10,000 and for God's sake, I'm homeless. I live in the woods. How am I going to come up with $10,000? Although Cheryl lives in a tent, not a house, having a permanent residence at Satoshi provides greater safety than she would have on the streets and that translates to greater stability. I feel if, even though I am homeless, we don't have to be without the amenities that we need. I have a stove. I cook at least seven days a week. Um, I could cook from pork chops to meatloaf. Um, you name it, I cook it. On the day our crew talked with Satoshi residents, Cheryl was cooking up a simple but hearty roast on an open fire. It's been cooking since about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I fried it on the beginning on the um, stove and then I put it in this pot with water and it's been boiling and the seasons are garlic, salt, pepper, and that's it. It's just delicious. It is. Another mm. good meal Thank out you. here. Thank you are you. so welcome. Mm. And do you have heat when it gets cold? Yes, ma'am, I sure do. I have. Can I come in here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's a little dirty. <laughs> oh, wow. We have, we have a propane heater. And we actually have our closet and our bed. It's kind of strung around. We make it like it's our home. This is our home. I was in a car wreck and lost my job and everything. Michael's the one who's made it possible for me to get uh, medical attention, get uh, have the time to get try to get the disability. And if it wasn't for him in Satoshi Forest, I wouldn't have the means to do it. 
Diagnosed with stage 3 kidney disease while living at Satoshi, Russell has been unable to work in his profession of manual labor since his car wreck. While settling in at Satoshi, Russell soul-searched his life and in doing so discovered creativity he didn't know that he had. Up until about a year ago, I didn't know I had the talent to do that stuff. All I've ever done, almost all of my life, is labor work. I don't go out panhandling or anything else. I do this to uh, make what money I do get. Russell's relocation from a traditional home to the forest came after informing Michael Kimbrell that he would have no option but to live on the streets, a circumstance Michael sought to and did prevent. He basically cold called uh, and I, I did have an opening coming up at the forest so I agreed to meet with him. One, Russell seemed like a perfect candidate for what we look for out here at the forest and then also, it seemed like this would be a good buffer from going straight to the streets. The streets out here um, can be a harsh reality for, for a lot of people coming straight from a house in, into homelessness. Forward to January 2016, a full 20 months after what had been Satoshi's first victory in court, Escambia County stepped up its campaign against the homeless community through legislation and successfully changed the previously existing land development code in order for violations against Satoshi to resume. The question became, was Satoshi a campground or was it a development? You know, most people think you can do whatever you want to do with your own land, but you know, the county regulations require that whatever use you have um, they get a say and so they issued a code violation for the use of tents on this commercially zoned property of so setting up tents they said was illegal the attorney's extensive experience with land use law code lent him optimism regarding Satoshi's chances of winning a legal battle and a permit I'm quite confident that if we were working to permit a commercial development then we would already have broken ground but we're trying to permit something that heretofore has never existed that is a permitted use of property as a homeless encampment or a place where people who do not have permanent structures exist the attorney's strategy then shifted to applying for a campground permit from the state. So we went back and forth. Uh, campgrounds are actually not regulated by the county, they're regulated by the state. And the health department had been coming out here for years. I mean, in fact, we had, you had to pay them to do the inspection. Paid for the inspections, paid for the sanitation portalettes. And in another positive turn, the State Department of Health ruled the forest was not a campground, thus extending a decision that cleared the way for Satoshi to continue its existence in what had represented a second major legal victory for Satoshi, Michael Kimbrell, and the homeless. So I don't know how you raise the money, but you raise the money somehow to pay the $849 application fee and we applied for a permit to do nothing, to actually just exist out here in the forest. Rick Grimes' Mayfair Coalition once again returned and stood against Satoshi at what was the permit hearing held in 2016. Neither side was giving up. Okay, I go into camps, I go into some pretty bad areas. This is the most well-kept, it's my last stop and I look, really look forward to it. Um, people are very productive there, they're self-sufficient, they have garbage cans out to the front right there, they don't have to go anywhere to take it out, they have porta potties I, if these people live next door to me, there is no, I'm a single woman, there is no doubt in my mind that I could call on any one of them if I ever had a problem, if something broke down, that they would help me. 
But despite Satoshi having agreed to meet all developmental requirements to improve fire safety, provide fencing, and a vegetation buffer with road access, I recommend that this development order, which there's a process, be denied. The county initially said okay, and then they reneged. Uh, then they said we had to build a road, and then they had, we had an agreement with them that we, a road wasn't necessary. They finally denied the permit because we hadn't asked for a road. So we have appealed that uh, denial. My official reaction is that I am shocked and not surprised at the same time, which is a really strange feeling. Uh, we fully expected to be denied today, but in a weird turn of events, we agreed to all the conditions and were still denied. After three years, the camp continues to exist and more important, continues to provide safe shelter for those in need. Yeah, you know, I hear things like, well, why don't you do it in your neighborhood? And the, the fact of the matter is, is I would if there had been a piece of property, you know, that was sufficient for the price in which we were, you know, working under. The permit denial was decided as the economy was recovering from the recession. New development, enabled by financiers, actualized city blocks with coffee shops, boutiques, and beer halls. I mean, this is a commercially zoned nine acres on Massachusetts. All of this could be cut down. I mean, it'd be ruined. But your use of it is compatible. I mean, it's the most compatible use. Only weeks before Christmas 2016, on a fateful December 7th, another county board convened again to decide the fate of the Satoshi homeless encampment that had been established on privately owned land. So we had a lot of meetings uh, with the county and the, the ultimate question was, what, what is it? What, what do you want us to do? What help us craft a application for the use that we are doing that you can evaluate under the land development code and get to an ultimate position of permit. It was not approved, it was denied. The development plan is denied for the reasons noted below. We'll note those below. Keep scrolling down. Exactly. Exactly. There isn't any. What's the denial? It was because of the requirements of the Land Development Code, they were not met. Even members of the board reviewing Satoshi's appeal at this latest stage expressed differing and concerning amounts of confusion. Based on the denial letter, it says see below, but there's nothing below. What, what should have been below is a reason for um, the access requirement and stormwater requirements were not met. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what it should say. Okay, let me back up here. So I'm trying to understand this yes. whole thing. In the beginning, when the DRC reviewed the project, what was the DRC reviewing? This ultimate board's vote was again a Satoshi setback when it ended in a deadlock, and this vote served to uphold the earlier denial of the land development permit. But Dunaway and his legal quest wasn't done yet. He countered with what was essentially a last resort, a request that a higher court review the entire case and render a new judgment. It was 2017, a new year, and the Hayward administration tried a new approach to ban panhandling outright within city limits after having been silent on the issue of homelessness for three years. And to address this latest attempt, citizens came out in numbers to lend voice to the powerless voiceless, the homeless. I have heard here all night how the city of Pensacola downtown is growing, how we have all these new apartments, condos, homes. Well, evidently, it's the panhandlers aren't affecting people moving downtown because we're having a big growth spurt. We objectify homelessness because we don't see them as people. 
And I believe that empathy is the way to treat this problem, not by seeing them as a nuisance. I work with street level homeless in Pensacola, specifically the downtown core that we're talking about. And I would have a hard time separating panhandling and homelessness. Local players often move through public proxies, including police, government, and nonprofits. But in this instance, given the volatile nature of the issue, even a few described as community elites made rare appearances to speak in favor of this panhandling but, ban. Um, the issue is not Amendment 1. It's, uh, it's not homelessness. It's, it's not freedom of speech. It's panhandlers that come before the visitors and customers downtown. Upon the Pensacola City Council passing the ordinance, the Florida American Civil Liberties Union stepped into the fray and partnered with local advocates that effectively, via lawsuit, swiftly defeated the ordinance, which, as it turned out, was the very thing Council Michael Kimbrell had warned would likely occur four years earlier. Thank you, and please think about this, table this, let a committee talk about this and give you their findings before you make a decision that is going to open up lawsuits. The first Judicial Circuit Court's ruling on the final Escambia County versus Satoshi Forest case arrived in September 2017. The court finds there was no competent substantial evidence to support the board's denial of the petitioner's land use application based upon the requirement of an all-weather road to service the portable toilets. Therefore, it is ordered that the decision of the Escambia County Board of Adjustment decision denying the appeal of the staff denial of the development order is hereby quashed. Mr. Dunaway's strategy having prevailed, Satoshi Forest and the residents were granted the right to exist. Escambia County was ordered to sign the development permit in February 2018. Four requirements were necessary and met to receive the final permit. A paved driveway apron was funded by a $27,000 anonymous donation. Volunteers installed gifted fencing materials. And a second group planted trees and vegetation between the forest and the Mayfair neighborhood. And fire extinguishers were donated and placed by the humanists of West Florida. Thus, with all requirements met and completed, Satoshi Forest may be the only permitted homeless tent encampment on private property in the United States, if not the world. But the original design for tiny homes, a bathhouse, and kitchen was postponed indefinitely due to expenses and delays that were incurred, the result of the four-year legal battle. Cheryl found employment. She and her husband Anthony found permanent housing after living in Satoshi for two years. Russell was finally awarded Social Security Disability due to his car wreck, including three years of back pay. He purchased a home in Alabama. Russell called Satoshi Forest his home for four long years. Ten years into this battle, Michael Kimbrell continues to attend meetings. Um, I run probably the largest homeless day center in Pensacola and have not spoken with anyone at the city about what it takes to do that, what the monthly operational costs are. I have always come to y'all offering to give my expertise free of charge. You know, and are we communicating? Are we working together? Do you want my help? Within all these events are clues as to how and why governments prevent individuals outside of regular charity institutions from helping the homeless. Satoshi residents are not renters, they are not homeowners, and as such, given the provision of basic human amenities, they are not considered to be quite homeless either. It challenges society's rigid expectations. Thus the question, what is actual homelessness? 
What does it look like in our contemporary, capitalistically driven society? And finally, what will address its issues and enable actual solutions? One hundred percent of your money goes to where it's supposed to go here, and so there is no the overhead is the project, and um, and so and I stand by that. Only ten percent of nonprofits operate that way, and it's I, one of the reasons I think I've been successful um, is Ready I I, I have community support. I do not have corporate support, and so, and we have built that community support, and it's so much more powerful and important than um, coming from above. And my philosophy, as you've gotten to know me over the years, has been one of bottom-up structuring and horizontal uh, planning. And so I, by keeping that, I have built that community. It is, it is the bottom coming up and helping one another. And so, uh, yeah, great yeah. answer. Great. Thank Whenever you. Whenever I piss him off, I get the best answers.